looking at counting cases. What this means is you'll be encountering problems like how many ways can we make a five letter word when the first letter is a consonant, the second letter is a consonant, the third and fourth letters are vowels, and the fifth letter is a consonant. Now the solution to this sort of problem might not be immediately like popping into your head, but we're going to teach you how to mathematically solve for problems like these along with problems much more complex than that one. Let's start with the basics. All right, imagine we take a coin and we flip it six times in a row. How many different possible outcomes will we have? Let's start listing them. Well, we could get all heads, we could get all tails, it could alternate, but we could list these as long as we want. How will we know for certain that we've counted all of them? Additionally, this doesn't look like it even begins to cover the possibilities of how many heads and how many tails we could flip. So how could we possibly count as many cases as there are? We're clearly not going to be able to write out all of them, so what can we do? After zero flips, you can see we only have one possibility, that nothing has happened. After one flip, we have two possibilities, heads and tails. So we go from one possibility to two possibilities. Now, after the second flip, each of these is going to branch out into two more possibilities, so then we're going to have four. As you can see, each time we go through a flip, it's multiplying the number of possibilities by two. So if we uh, look at the first flip after one flip, it's two to the one to the first power, that's how many we have, right? Because you're only multiplying one by two one time. Once we get to two flips, you'll notice that it becomes two to the second. And that's because each successive time, we're gonna multiply by two. So after six flips, we're going to have two to the sixth possibilities. Two to the sixth is equal to 64, I believe. So there'll be 64 possible outcomes for the sequence of heads or tails that we have. This brings us in to the fundamental principle of counting, or the fundamental counting principle, whichever you prefer. That in order to find the number of ways something can happen, you multiply together the number of ways each individual thing can happen, assuming all of those events are independent of each other, right? And what independent of each other means is that if we flip a heads the first time, then the second time, that doesn't matter. We could have flipped heads or we could have flipped tails. It's not gonna influence the chances for the second time. How we apply this is say we want to flip a coin and roll a die, okay? How many ways can that happen? Well, two ways to flip the coin multiplied by six ways the die could come up, and we get that there are 12 possible ways that this could happen. And it's really as simple as that. Now, if we only rolled the die, if we flipped a heads, then you couldn't just multiply because one event depends on the other. But if we're going to flip the, die, flip the coin and roll the die, no matter what the other result is, then we can just multiply them together. And that's the sort of problem we'll generally be dealing with today. We're gonna do a quick practice problem. All right, so we're gonna be counting the number of four letter words we can form. When I say four letter words, I don't mean actual words like door exclusively. I mean any sequence of four letters. Okay, this counts too. This is not a word. I don't know how you would pronounce it, but it counts. As do regular words, we're not excluding regular words, but any sequence of four numbers, R, S, V, U, counts. All right, so how would we do this? First things first, how many possibilities are there for the first letter? Well, there's 26. How many for the second letter? Well, there's 26. How many for the third letter? Well, there's 26. And how many for the fourth letter? 26. And what we get is that the number of four letter words is equal to 26 to the fourth power. Now, I don't know what 26 to the fourth power is, and quite frankly, if you're doing the classwork and you write 26 to the fourth power instead of multiplying it all out, that's perfectly fine. So, 
our answer, 26 to the fourth power. Remember, I'm not looking for whether or not you know how to multiply giant numbers together. Like that's not what we're testing on your classwork. We're testing whether you know how to count cases properly. And this would show me that you knew how to count cases properly. So you'd be marked correct on my classwork. Let's move on to another practice problem. In this problem, we're gonna be counting how many license plates are possible. Now, the first thing we have to do is define what we mean by license plate. Now, all problems on the exams will be, and the classwork and the homework, they'll be very straightforward in what they want you to count. We don't care about the case of the letter. We don't care about, um, I don't know, the state. We only care about the sequence Letter, sorry, number, letter, 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 number, number, and I forgot a, no, number, 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 yeah. So there'll be seven in all. A number, three letters, three numbers. What we don't want is something that's not seven of the letters, like this, which is only six characters, where not all of them are in the correct sequence, and where there are other possible symbols. We don't care about those. So. How can we count the number of standard license plates possible? How many possibilities are there for the first spot, for the first number? Well, there's 10, right? There's 10, right? You could have zero through nine, any of those data. So we'll write 10. Next, we have three letters, which is 26 times 26 times 26 for the number of possibilities. So that's gonna be 26 to the third power. Three more numbers. Each of those has 10 possible answers. So we're gonna have 10 to the fourth power. Sorry, to the third power. And when you multiply these tens together, you get 26 to the third power times 10 to the fourth power. And that would be the answer. That's how many license plates are possible. Standard license plates. All right, now, if you're feeling up to it, on your lecture notes under 8.1, Try the practice problem, the second practice problem, the one about vowels and consonants. And I'll show you the solution in three, two, one. The first slot in this four letter word has to be a consonant. And the problem specifies there are 21 consonants. All right, the second one has to be a vowel which specifies there are five vowels. The third one also has to be a vowel. And the last one, a consonant. Multiplying this all together, you'll get 21 squared times 25. Again, if you leave it in that form, it's perfectly fine. And that's the answer. The fundamental counting principle is not always the way to go. Sometimes we have to apply it in some sneaky ways instead of just multiplying everything together. All right. We have five different colored candies and five children to give it to you. All right. You might think, all right, each kid has their choice of five candies. Five times five times five times five times five. But no. Here's the first kid. She is going to pick the blue candy. All right. She had five options for that candy. There were five ways she could pick the candy. She could pick any of the five candies. All right, but then it's her turn. She does not have five options because this girl has already taken the blue candy. So how many options does she have? Well, she has four options. And let's say she picked, I don't know, the orange candy. All right, now the third kid has three choices, and he wants the candy cane. The fourth kid has two choices, and he, well, he doesn't like grape candies a lot, but it's a lot better than a lousy mint, so he takes the grape candy. All right, and the last kid, this poor guy, is stuck with the lousy mint. He has only one choice of candy. And that means that we have to multiply not five times five times five times five times five, but five times four times three times two times one, which is 100 
and 20. All right, and that's how you count something when you can't repeat elements. What I mean by when you can't repeat elements, I mean, well, no repeats, right? Each of them cannot repeat choosing the same candy. The same thing would happen if we wanted to order them. How many ways can we order these five children? How many ways can we sit them in a row of chairs? How many different orders can they sit in? Well, it's just like the candy problem. There are five chairs. The first kid has five options of where to sit down. The second four, the third three, then two, and the last kid is forced to sit wherever the other kids didn't want to. All right, and that's how counting works when you cannot repeat elements. We're gonna do a quick practice problem. How many four letter words can we make? However, there's a condition. No letter can be repeated, right? Door does not count anymore because there are two O's. We want only one of each letter. All right, so how many ways can we do this? The first letter, has, can be any letter, right? 26 is the number we put here because it could be any letter. The next one, well, say we put A here, can be anything except that letter, so 25. The next one can be anything except those two letters, so 24. And the last one can be anything except for those three letters, so 23. And so our answer is 26 times 25 times 24 times 23. Try the second practice problem on your lecture notes under 8.2. I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. So the first uh, letter in the four letters can be any consonant, so we're gonna have 21. The second letter can be any vowel, so times 25, sorry, times five. The third letter can be any vowel except this one, so four. And the last letter can be any consonant except this one, so 20. And this ends up equaling 8,400. Now, if you left it in this form, again, that's fine, but this one's pretty easy to multiply out. This is 20, this is 20, that's 400. 400 times 21 is 8,400. So with things that are pretty easy to multiply out, it's easier to grade if you just multiply it out. But again, it's not required. Imagine you're taking an exam, but you're lucky it's a multiple choice exam. So how many ways can we fill it out if it's seven questions? Well, let's assume for a moment that each question has four possible answers, but we don't have to pick one. If we don't think we know it, we can leave it blank. So there's five options for each question any of the four answers, or leaving it blank. So, the first one, five options. The second one, five options. The third one, five options. All of them have five options, which means we're going to just multiply them all together because what we pick for question one doesn't affect at all what we have to pick for question two, right? So, we multiply five by five by five by five by five by five by five, which is five to the seventh power, because there's seven questions, and that's our answer, five to the seventh power. So we're gonna have a cat show, and our goal is to figure out how many ways we can place them in first, second, third, fourth, and fifth place. So how can we do this? Well, this is called a permutation. We're figuring out how many ways we can order objects, and how we write this is, well, there's five objects, and, then we write P for permutation. We want to take all five of them and order them. So we do. This cat maybe goes here. It has five choices. This cat then only has four times three times two times one choice for where it goes. All right. And that means that five permute five is equal to five factorial. And what a factorial is, is when we take one number, like five, we multiply five times four times three times two times one. One factorial is just one. Two factorial, two times one. Six factorial, six times five times four times three times two times one. And a number n permutes all n of those objects equals n factorial. But what if 
we're not, we're not placing all of these guys, right? We just want first, second, and third place. Those are the only ones that get ribbons anyways, so why do those even matter? So we're actually gonna permute three of these. We're gonna take five objects and we're gonna order three of them. So, in this case, not all cats are gonna get a seat, so we can't really use the logic of, okay, cats are gonna pick a seat. We're just gonna reverse it and have the seat pick a cat. So for the first place seat, there are five options. For the second place seat, there are four options. And for the third place seat, there are three options. Now you'll notice that the remaining two, right, the difference between five and three is going to be eliminated, right? That much, that factor is gonna be taken out. So instead of being 120, it's only gonna be 60 ways, right? And the reason for this is because the arrangement of these last two does not matter at all. So this is how, this is the formula for permutations. N permute K objects equals N factorial over N minus K, the difference factorial. Now, if we have N permute N, right, we do N minus N factorial, but wait, that's n factorial over zero factorial. So the question is, what is zero factorial, right? Because we know it should equal n factorial, and by that logic, zero factorial should equal one. And that's exactly what it, what it is. Zero factorial equals one. Might seem counterintuitive, but in this session, we're not gonna go into why that is. If you want to know, you can always ask me in class. Now let's move on to a few practice problems using permutations. This next problem is the most difficult one we've done so far. So I have five books on my bookshelf and I want to arrange them. Pretty easy, you would do five factorial to figure out how many ways we can permute them. However, these two books are part of the series. They're book one and book two, and I want them to stay together. Now I don't care if book two comes before book one, if they're swapped, Either way, I don't care what order they're in, but I want them to be next to each other. So how do we do this? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually first figure out, we're gonna treat this like it's one book, right? And then we're gonna figure out how many ways we can permute the whole shelf, which is four factorial, which is, I believe, 24. But we aren't finished, right? Because for any way we arrange this, for any of those 24 ways, we could always arrange these books differently. So how many are, ways are there to arrange these two books? Well, the permutation for, uh, formula says two factorial, which is two. And that makes a lot of sense because we can do one then two or two then one. So we multiply the ways to arrange the colors by the ways to arrange the purples inside of the colors and we get 48. So here you see us using permutations and the fundamental principle of counting, the fundamental counting principle at the same time. How a combination works is we're going to make a smaller group from a larger group. So five choose three would be the number of ways we can select a group of three from a group of five. So we have n choose k, just like n permute k. All right, let's do A, B, C, and D. And we wanna pick two letters, okay? So four, choose two. Simple enough. Now, let's look at four permute two. Four permute two is gonna be 12, right? As we know from the permutation formula. However, the issue with this is that it's going to count A, B, and B, A as two different things. Now, a combination is just a permutation, but the order doesn't matter in a combination. So we have to divide by the number of ways to permute the result. Now the result is only going to be k length, right? So we have to divide by k factorial, the number of ways to permute a list of length k. So the actual formula for n choose k would be just the permutation formula, sorry, n choose k, yeah, just the permutation formula divided by k factorial. And that's the only difference. So while four uh, permute two is 12, four choose two is six. 
and that makes sense. We could do A, B, we could do A, C, we could do A, D, we could do B, C, we could do B and D, and we can do C and D. That's me counting all six ways to choose a group of two from four. But again, these combinations will get a lot more complicated as we go on. Four choose three. It can be written like this, or it can be written like this. This means how many ways with a group of four can we pick out a group of three from that group? Well, the formula says four factorial over three factorial, and then also over whatever four minus three is factorial of that. Four minus three is one, so it's also over one factorial. Now, four factorial is just four times three times two times one. Three factorial is three times two times one. So four factorial is just four times three factorial. So this cancels out with this. So then it's just four over one factorial. And one factorial is one. So four over one equals four. So four choose three equals four. This is what is known as Pascal's triangle. It continues forever downwards. But this is the top. The top is one, and each spot beneath it is got by adding the numbers above it. So look at the six here. You'll notice the two numbers above it are three and three. Since three plus three is six, six goes there. And that's how you make the triangle, right? You start with one, then you do one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one. And that's how we expand Pascal's triangle. Now there's a lot of patterns in Pascal's triangle. It's like a gold mine for mathematical patterns, but there's one specific pattern that we're interested in. This pattern is that, let's take x plus y. If we raise it to the zero power, then we just get one. If we raise it to the first power, we get one x plus one y. If we raise it to the second power, we get one x squared plus two x y plus one y squared. You'll notice that the coefficients in these expressions correspond with the rows in Pascal's triangle. Now, the first row in Pascal's triangle, the one with only a one, is actually called the zeroth row. And then the one with two ones, that's called the first row. So basically the pattern is that the number row you have is the pattern of coefficients when you take that power and raise an expression to it. And we're gonna figure out how we can use this. We wanna raise this expression to the sixth power. So we take the sixth row, which is actually the seventh row, because we have a zeroth row. But we take this sixth row right here, this pattern of coefficients, one, six, 15, 20, six, 20, 20, 15, six, one. And what we do is we write out those coefficients, one, six, 15, 20, 15, six, one. And then we start putting on what they're multiplying. Well, the first one is just x to the sixth. Then we decrease x by one, so we have x to the fifth, and we increase y by one times y. Then we decrease x, so x to the fourth y squared, then, then both to the third power, then x squared y to the fourth power, then x times y to the fifth power, and lastly, just y to the sixth power. And that's the order that we put them in. Of course, you could also do the same thing starting with y to the sixth and then working your way down to x to the sixth, because x plus y is the same as y plus x, and this is symmetrical anyways. But it's easiest just to start at the beginning, take the first number, raise it to the sixth, and then work your way down until you have the last number raised to the sixth power. And that's how we do Pascal's triangle. But what if we wanted to raise something to like the 17th power? Well, you could use Pascal's triangle, that would work. Um, it would take a while to write it down all the way to the 17th row. Additionally, what if you only wanted, say, an expression x plus y to the 17th power, and we want the sixth term in that expression. Well, to find the sixth term in that expression would take a long time if you were going to find everything and use Pascal's triangle. So we have something called the binomial theorem to help us do that. All right, here's how the binomial theorem works. This looks really scary, but most of it's just evaluating factorials. All the work happens above my arm. So this is the formula. X plus y to the n equals the sum from k equals zero to n of n choose k times x to the n minus k, y to the k. Now, our problem is to find the fourth term of x plus y to the sixth power. Now, n equals six because we're raising x and y to the sixth power. And if we wanted to find the entire expansion, we would use the sum notation and find every term from k equals zero to six. But we don't have to do that, right? We only want the fourth term. So, we take k equals three, because remember, zero, k equals zero is the first term, so k equals three will be the fourth term. Then we 
we just plug that in. 6 choose 3 times x to the 6 minus 3, y to the 3, which is equal to 6 choose 3, x to the 3, y to the 3. Evaluating 6 choose 3, we eventually get 20 equals x to the 3, y to the th 21, x to the 3, y to the 3, which is actually what we got last time for the fourth term of this expression. Remember, if we're raising it to the sixth power, we're going to have seven terms in our expression, right, because we start at zero. So we have one more than the power we're raising it to. So there's many other things we can do with the binomial theorem, and we're not always going to be raising stuff just to x and y, though. Take a moment to try this practice problem. Find the sixth term in the expansion, x squared minus 3y cubed, all raised to the eighth power. Remember to find n and k before you continue. The answer is 13,608 times x to the 6th, y to the 15th. That's a big number. How did we get there? All right. So first we plug it in, right? The first term is 8 choose 5. With a little simplification, we get the 8 choose 5 equals 56. Next, we have x squared to the 8 minus 5. That's just x squared to the 3rd power, and x squared to the 3rd power is just x to the 6th power. This last one is where it gets interesting. Negative 3, y to the 3rd power to the 5th power. Well, we take negative 3 to the 5th power times y to the, well, 3rd to the 5th is 15th, times y to the 15th. Well, then we have negative 3 to the 5th power, which is 243, negative 243. Then we multiply the three terms together, and we get negative 56 times 243, x to the 6th, y to the 15th. If you want to leave it in this form on an exam, you're fine. Even if you want to leave the 243 as 3 to the 5th power, you're fine. But just to simplify, we get, actually this should be negative, 13,608 y to the 6th, sorry, x to the 6th, y to the 15th. There should be a negative sign here, but yeah. We're going to learn about casework next, and casework isn't exactly something that you can teach. It's more of a critical thinking skill, so you're going to have to use your brain. Now, the, I'm just going to show you casework through an example problem, and our example problem is Joe's Ice Cream Shop. You have to get at least one flavor, no bowls of just toppings, and at least one flavor. You can't get anything more than two flavors, so essentially you can get one or two flavors. That's it. The sum of your... The number of flavors and the number of toppings you have is maximum three. So that means if you get one flavor, you can get two toppings or one topping or no toppings. And if you can get if you get two flavors, you can get one topping or no topping. There are four flavors and there are six toppings. And the question is, how many ice cream bowls are possible? So let's do a bit of casework and try to find out. The casework work should look something like this. First things first, we got to divide it into two cases, right? We're going to count up how many ice cream cones with one flavor you can make and how many ice cream cones you can make with two flavors. Once we figure out how many ways you can make with one flavor, which is going to end up being 88, and two flavors, which is going to end up being 42, we can add them up to get the total number of flavors. But let's take a quick look at case one where we have only one flavor. Well, there's four ways to pick our flavor, right? Because there's four flavors, four choose one is four. But you can't just then multiply it by something because you have three subcases, right? The toppings, you're either gonna take zero, one, or two toppings. So how many ways can you choose your toppings if you have one flavor? Well, the first case, you have zero toppings, right? And there's only one way to do that, just get nothing. With two topping, let's start with one topping, there are six ways to do that. Pick any one of the six toppings. And with two toppings, there are six choose two ways to do that, which ends up being 15 ways to pick two toppings. Which means, in total, there are 22 ways to pick toppings if you have only one flavor. Sorry, yeah, if you have only one flavor. Now, we're going to multiply that together, right? 22 ways to pick toppings times 4 ways to pick your flavor equals 88 total ice cream cones you can make with one flavor. Case 2 is a little bit less complicated, right? You have 6 ways to pick your flavors because it's 4 choose 2, right? And then you have um, case A and case B, which are 1 topping and 0 topping. So case A is 0 toppings. Again, there's only one way to do that get no toppings. And case B 
There are six ways to do that. Pick any one of the six toppings, which means there's seven ways to choose your toppings if you get two flavors. Multiplying seven by six, we get 42. Then again, we add 42 to 88 to get 130, which is our answer. We've been using factorials quite a bit, so I thought maybe I would touch upon how you would solve an expression like n plus one factorial over n factorial. Now consider five factorial. Five factorial is equal to five times four factorial. And likewise, n plus one factorial is equal to n plus one times n factorial. When we simplify it to that, we can cancel out the n factorials and we're just left with n plus one. Now, of course, the ones on the exam are going to be more complicated than this, but essentially you would just use factorial rules to either um, break apart or put together factorial expressions in order to solve these sorts of problems. Over counting. So we have a problem and we have the word pour. Now I've made the two O's different colors just so that I can show you stuff, but for now we're going to assume that it's all, the, in the actual problem, it's just gonna say P-O-O-R. Okay, the color is not gonna matter. I'm just using this to show you things. So we're gonna find the number of permutations of these letters. You might think, okay, there's four letters. To arrange four things, it's, that's four permute four, which is four factorial. Yeah, four factorial. So you might think, okay, cool, 24. But you'd be wrong, because if we count 24, then we count O-O-P-R as something else than O-O-P-R, even though those are really the same thing, because we're treating these two O's as if they're different, when really they're the same. So, when we're trying to find these sorts of permutations, it's important to look at each element. In this word, we have three different elements. We have P, O, and R. There's one P, two O's, and one R. We have to divide by each of these factorial. So four factorial over one factorial, divided by two factorial, divided by one factorial. Now we usually just disregard any of the non-repeated elements because then you're just dividing by one factorial, which is like dividing by one. So we just focus on anything that has more than one, right? If it was P-O-R poorer, if we were doing poorer with an E-R, we have to divide by two factorial again because then there would be two r's as well. So you just divide by any repeated element there is and that's all there is to it. So you would, instead of getting 24, you would get 12, right? Because for each pair, there's gonna, there's gonna be two for each actual individual arrangement. And that's how you correct any time you may have overcounted. The last thing we're gonna talk about are some techniques to counting. All right, we're gonna talk about counting negatives. Now, there are two different meanings to that term, counting negatives, and we're gonna go over both of them. Firstly, imagine we have five people and 10 spots. How many, how many ways can we arrange those five people into the 10 spot? We just invent empty placeholder. These are ghosts, they just count as empty spots. There's five of them. So we're gonna to try to arrange these five ghosts and these five people, 10 factorial. But remember, there are five repeated elements from the five ghosts. So we have to divide by five factorial. And so our answer is 10 factorial over five factorial because we had those five ghosts as our empty placeholders and no empty seat is different than another empty seat. So they're just repeated elements. Thus, we have to divide by five factorial. And that's our answer. This is a really big number, so on an exam, just leave it like that. It's gonna be up in the thousands and I don't feel like doing it out and you shouldn't waste your time on an exam doing out factorial. So this is perfectly fine. The last thing we're going to talk about is the second way to count empty space. Sometimes it's just easier to count ways that something isn't than to count ways that something is. For example, we wanna choose a group of 10 letters and it has to include at least one of A, B, or C, and can have no repeats. All right, how do we even start? Well, it would be really easy, it would be difficult to figure out how many groups contain A, B, or C, but you know it's not difficult? Finding out how many groups don't contain A, B, or C. Right, it's just 23, choose 10. Choose 10 of the other 23 letters, and that's how many don't have A, B, or C in them. 
easy. But how does that help us figure out how many do? Well, what's the total number of groups of 10 letters you can make? Well, that's 26 times 10. If we subtract the numbers, uh, the number of ways that you make can make a group without A, B, or C, we will get the number of ways that you can make a group with A, B, or C. 26 choose 10 and 23 choose 10 are both very big numbers, so I'm not going to evaluate them. You won't have anything with this big numbers on your exam, though, so don't worry. But essentially, that's the concept behind counting negative space in this way. And this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Agora Math Circle. And just a heads up, I really hope that you'll go back and make sure you understand all of the example problems in this lecture because three of those example problems I used throughout the lecture, I'm not going to tell you which ones, but three of the example problems in this lecture and in this video will be on the classwork for the lecture, for the session. So make sure you go through, understand, email me or any of your other teachers if you don't understand one of these examples. Just make sure to understand the examples before coming to class to get those three questions on your classwork correct. Don't forget to subscribe and like. If you have any questions, you can email info at agoramathcircle.org or comment below and we'll reply back. Maybe. And if you want to see practice things or anything about us, you can visit our website, which is basically the end of the email, but without the info and the end. So bye!